Hello, everyone. We're back. Possibilities with Monique DeMeo. I have an incredibly special guest with us today, Pamela Rickman. She is a badass rock star. I can't even, I have so many words for her and they're all positive. So let me tell you a little bit about her first. She's an Emmy winning producer and writer with a focus on women in the workforce. How appropriate that she'd be here with us today. She's the author of Candace Pert, Genius, Greed, and Madness in the World of Science, published by Hachette in 2023, a biography of a maverick scientist about which the Wall Street Journal said, with exemplary research, balanced accounts, and deeply evocative prose, Ms. Rickman's biography offers a truly insightful narrative on what it can mean to be a woman at the cutting edge of science. Additionally, Publishers Weekly said, riveting biography, nuanced portrait, readers will be engrossed. And I certainly was because I've read the book. Rickman's first book, you may have already heard about, Stiletto Network, Inside the Women's Power Circles That Are Changing the Face of Business. That was published by HarperCollins Leadership in 2013. That book received a starred review from Publishers Weekly. Most recently, Rickman is the executive producer of The Flag Makers, a documentary by Oscar winner Cynthia Wade and Sharon Lees. Nat Geo, Disney Plus, and Hulu. She has written for the New York Times, Financial Times, and the Washington Post, among many other publications. Welcome, Pamela. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. This is an honor. So much fun. So tell us about your journey from Stiletto Network to Candace Pert. This is quite a different type of authorship style. Do tell. It is. And yet what I'll say, what they have in common is strong female characters. I mean, that is something that I've always been attracted to in all of my work. And I think, you know, women at a crossroads, women at, at junctions in their careers and lives where they could go one way or the other, those sort of meaty stories are what I've loved for my entire life, both, you know, as a consumer and as a writer or producer. So, but to, to go back about 10 years, I was a journalist for the New York Times. I was writing about entrepreneurship, and I attended an event that brought together 50 of some of the nation's most high-powered women. 25 mm -hmm. women from the East Coast flew west to Silicon Valley to network and learn from their Valley Girl counterparts. And the, the, the <laughs> controversial thesis of that article that I wrote for the New York Times is that Valley Girls do it better that the unique entrepreneurial ecosystem of Silicon Valley allowed women and minorities the ability to move more quickly in their careers and to take more risks. No kidding. Yeah. And so it was at that event, actually, in 2010 or 2011, that I met all of these women. And I started to, I love trend stories. And I started to find groups of women from their 20s to their 70s in all industries, again, in all age groups, doing the same thing at the same moment in history what I called stiletto networks. Now, most of the groups had no more than 10 women, but in aggregate, it was millions of women globally. And I followed the money because I was writing I was writing for the business section of the New York Times. So I couldn't exactly go to my business editor and say, oh my God, women are going to dinner. You know, <laughs> like I would have been laughed out of them. So I had to follow the money and I charted billions of dollars of transactions and corporate board seats attained and companies founded and funded all as a result of these little groups. And so this was pre me too. I never could have anticipated that. But the thesis was that, that in the next decade, we were going to see an explosion of female wealth and power, you know, a, a huge rolling thunder. And so that, you know, whether that's happened or not, I think COVID, you know, set us back certainly. And there, there have been certain, certain other aspects that I couldn't have, have predicted. But I do think that the world has changed considerably in the next, in the last 10 years and that story really primed me in many ways for Candace's story because I interviewed so many trailblazing women and I saw their stories in context of wider, of women's history, economic history, sociology. And so I was coming, when I discovered Candace Pert, I was sort of coming with this, this background of deep, deep knowledge of sort of women's experiences. That's amazing. You really did tie the knot for me really well and, and also re and solidified why I need to go back and read Stiletto Network. Yikes! I bet. But I think that that is exactly what's happening. I think um, on a larger scale and on a small scale, these micro groups getting together and making an impact and, and you know, the, the ripple effect of these small groups 
out in the world. And when you have small groups making that same effort at the same time, it is monstrous what can happen. It was like this mass Venn diagram, you know, where these interlocking circles where someone from LA would say, you know, to a friend from New York, oh, well, when you're, when you're in town, come meet with my group. And it was all about, you know, what do you need and how can we help? At, you know, leaving your dreams, whatever you need, sort of, it could be, you know, come sit at my table at this gala and donate to my event, or it could be, I need a new CMO, or it could be, you know, help my kid get into college, whatever it is, it was women helping each other achieve their dreams and change the world in the process. Yes, absolutely. Do you know, that's how we got to, we, that's how we got to know each other. It's, I came in indirectly to meet Sarah from a woman called Red, who Red's table she was hosting women's dinners and it was my first dinner. She had me at her dinner and we were talking and she said, oh my God, you have to meet Sarah. First of all, I think you'll love her. And second of all, you should be a speaker for Sarah. I'm like, okay, okay, whatever. And then, so I go to, and I meet you and I'm like, oh my God, mind blown. This is exactly where I'm supposed to be at this time. It was funny. It's comforting and it's loving and it's effective. You know, that's the, that's the fun part. It's like, it's actually really fun. It's baited, it's based, it's based what you just said, you're going to love her in true female friendship. And it is changing the world, but it's actually also, it's making lots of money. Yeah. It's like, it's like, why not have fun while you're doing that? Like, that's my, I'm too old not to have fun, right? <laughs> Say yes more often. That's my not motto. Seriously. So tell us a little bit about, so Candace Pert, which by the way, I was very upset that I didn't know her because as someone who loves integrative medicine and functional medicine and spirituality with mind body connections and all this stuff she is the queen of that she's the pioneer of this tell us about this amazing human candace Perk. i didn't know about her either and i was interested in mind body work and it, her, someone recommended to me her 1997 memoir called molecules of emotion and the way i my way into this story was so in the last decade, um, Stiletto Network was optioned and I ended up working on a bunch of, of film and TV projects and realizing that I absolutely love that work. I wasn't intending to pivot from journalism at that moment, but these but doors opened. As a result, I tell everybody Stiletto Network absolutely changed my life and I'm so grateful. So I was working as a, in, my, in a producer capacity. I was wearing my producer hat. I read her memoir and thought, holy cow, this is like hidden figures meets a beautiful mind. <laughs> Perfect. Wait, stop right there. Say that again, slowly. Go ahead. Like hidden figures meets a beautiful mind. Her personal story as a woman up against the scientific establishment, um, really coming out with revolutionary ideas in the early 80s was, um, was mind blowing to me. And my initial intention was to make a film about her career, but her book came out in 1997 and she passed away in 2013. So then it was an opportunity to put on my reporter hat again. And I worked with her widower and her family, her children, her colleagues who are, I, I started conducting all of these interviews thinking, okay, what are the last 30 pages of a script? You know, how does her story end? And what I ended up discovering was so mind blowing that it necessitated another book. You know, I mean, this was really just sort of like following my a process of following my nose. And to your earlier point, I just couldn't believe why doesn't the world know about this extraordinary woman and how can I sort of bring her back into public consciousness. Right. Do you want to give us a couple of like high level takeaways without blowing obviously the, the book because I want everybody to read it. And I definitely think this should be a mini series. Somebody needs to knock on your door, do a documentary or a limited edition series because this shit has legs. Well, thank you. I agree. I, I mean, that's, that was the thought from the start and that is sort of manifesting and like, you know, that's sort of what's, what's in the, what's in the process. So, so to give you sort of the, the high level on Candace Pert, Candace Pert was a renowned neuroscientist and pharmacologist who stood at the dawn of three revolutions, the opioid crisis, the AIDS crisis, and the mind-body revolution. She was really the mother of the mind-body revolution. And that has led to integrative health or functional medicine as we know it. She was the scientific prodigy who was you know, 30 or 40 years ahead of her time preaching a holistic approach to healthcare long before wellness took root in our vernacular. Nobody was talking about wellness or doing yoga in the early 80s. I mean, Candace really changed history and launched an entire paradigm shift in medicine. But one thing I like to say is not without a fight, you know? You know, and to give a little background, 
in the 1980s, in the early 80s, when she was doing these seminal studies that proved that the brain is not the control center of the body, no one thought that stress could cause disease. You know, no one thought that our mental or our emotional states could influence our physiology. But Candace showed, again, that the brain is not the control center of the body, but rather it works in concert with our immune system, our endocrine system, our central nervous system, our gut, to shape our thoughts and emotions, like to shape our entire reality. Sometimes the way that we, our brain is sort of perceiving how we are feeling, it's predetermined. Our body, when I say I have a gut feeling, our body has already decided. And then our brain is the last to the party making sense of it all, you know, trying to interpret that data. But the brain is not the one sort of logically plotting a roadmap toward, you know, our, our emotions and our, and our actions. So that was, you know, that was revolutionary. That's incredible. I mean, I, I, we could expand on that a, a tremendous amount because she, she had the science, like you said, I don't want to repeat what you said, but it, the science behind supporting the thesis that you guys don't get it there. It, and then the mind body barrier when it's broken and what, and then the stuff that happens as a result of that. And it completely changed how people should have looked at medicine. It did. I mean, well, it was also, I mean, at the time, again, it was remarkably controversial because in asserting the mind-body link, so at that point, by the way, Candace was chief of brain biochemistry at the National Institute of Mental Health, which was a subsidiary of the National Institutes of Health, right? I mean, she was one of the nation's top scientists. She was a tenured scientist there. She actually had maximum, ostensibly had maximum credibility, and yet was also sort of a woman in a, in a, in a largely male world. And so here comes Candace, and she's remarkably young at the time when she's doing these studies. And here comes Candace, and she's not just pushing the bounds of her field. She is actually refuting the reigning paradigm that was established by Rene Descartes, the father of philosophy and science. And this had been in practice. Uh, the entire Western medical system had been built upon this paradigm. And, and this is actually a very fun story, the way that this all, and I learned this from Candace. So in, in the 1600s, Descartes wanted to autopsy bodies. He wanted to see how our systems worked. So in order to do that, to, to be sanctioned to do that, he went to the Pope and he and the Pope agreed that above the neck, that the head, the brain held humans, man's at the time, inherent sacredness, that this was our communion with the divine. And then basically everything below the neck was like a meat sack. You know, it was like our bodies were just there to carry around our heads. And it was our brains that actually were our high, you know, that was where our, where our you know, higher intelligence resided. So in, in saying, in suggesting, daring to suggest the body's innate intelligence, that actually the, 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 the idea that the mind or consciousness was mobile and actually the the um, it, it's you know it was conducted in this sort of multi-directional highway of flowing neuropeptides throughout our bodies. This is what Candace was saying. She was contesting the very basis on which Western medicine was built. It was like it's the entire basis of modern scientific thought. And so at the time, she really just received eye rolls reserved for mysticism. I mean, she was being laughed out of rooms and told that she was a crazy person. Because the entire her employer, the whole Nas National Institutes of Health, was built upon this system. And so it was designed according to that Cartesian view where there's a rigid hierarchy and the way that grants are structured. People work in, there's a silo-based funding structure. People work narrowly in their stovepipes. And all of these specialists are clinging white knuckle to their little patches of power. So if you're a virologist, you're thinking about how to eradicate disease, but you're not thinking about how it got there in the first place and how maybe stress caused it or, you know, our thoughts and emotions have put us into fight or flight. And maybe that's why and what we can do to prevent it in the first place. That was anathema in science at the time. Wow. So she's a young, attractive woman in a system that's been pretty calcified. It's probably a good idea, a good word. Um, I read when I read this book, I thought there were some very disturbing facts of, about our medical and healthcare regulatory system, the governing bodies that are supposed to protect our health and 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 wellness. Now we can use the word wellness and the checks and balances that were clearly not necessarily in place. We had the NIMH, the CDC, the CMS, the DEA, the HRSA. I mean, all of these governing bodies 
you unpacked some incredible stuff. Like I felt like you were an author. You definitely showed your um, reporter chops in this book because I just was like, oh my God, tell us a little bit about what this woman had to face and then what you un unearthed. Yeah. I mean, this is, a, I, in the spring, I spent um, 50 to 60 hours a week uh, on the call with lawyers doing a, doing a very extensive legal read because I am saying I'm sort of unearthing facts that you know, in some cases have been reported before in the 80s. I mean, it was interesting going through COVID and um, do, at the same time I was sort of working at my little desk in 2020 at home, I was reading um, primary literature articles from the 1980s and realizing that so many of the same men in power uh, telling us to trust science were actually in power or in rising to power in the early 80s and and actually doing things that were quite corrupt. And so it was it was very destabilizing for me at that time doing that primary research. But I think I, I think Candace was sabotaged and undermined in a lot of different ways and in more than one institution. And I think one way and actually this is a good a good segue into sort of one of her other major accomplishments because she was like this Forrest Gump figure who played major roles in these different in these different aspects of American history is to sort of talk about the opioid crisis. So Candace was a, um, she had gotten accidentally pregnant out of wedlock, you know, at age 19. I mean, she was really, she was a wild woman in every area of life. She really pushed, you know, pushed the bounds. I have to say the uh, nude yoga really got me. I had to say that was, that was <laughs> yeah, one. <laughs> do nude yoga. She at a um, at an NIH uh, Halloween party at the height of toxic shock syndrome. She dressed up as a bloody tampon. You know what I mean? That's like <laughs> you got. You know you party with her if she was alive today. You know what I mean? She was fun. She was wild. She did kooky things. You know. She was also absolutely a genius, and so she yeah. managed to sort of make her way into one of the pres most prestigious um, PhD programs in the country. Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, she was studying neuropsychopharmacology. This was at the dawn of like trying to figure out how the brain worked and whether you could, whether people could devise drugs to to fix addiction, to you know, to help with depression, with mental illness. She was really at the forefront of of that of basically creating that field. And so the history of that is the history is kind of exciting. We think, you know, most of what's reported is that the opioid crisis really started in the in the 1990s, but it didn't. It actually started in 1971 or the late 60s, early 70s, because before we had our current drug addiction, we had at that time a huge swath of the population who was addicted to heroin. And there were stories of, you know, the white middle class teenagers dying in the street. And 25% of all soldiers fighting in, in Vietnam were addicted to a form of heroin that was 95% pure versus like street heroin here. Richard Nixon wanted to escalate bombing in Vietnam. So he decided to declare war on drugs. He said, well, if I can take credit for this development at home, then I will, you know, I'll get more support for my, you know, my international goals. He poured, he declared war on drugs, poured tons of money into, into a scientific race to figure out the mechanism by which opiates worked in the brain. Candace was a young woman. She was, this was scientists the world over, ran to, 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 fit, to solve this mystery. And Candace did it. She was a 26 year old grad student at Johns Hopkins. And she thought that she was taking the first step in eradicating heroin addiction. She thought that she was going to cure addiction. And what ended up happening was, well, and here's going back to your original question, why she got screwed. The technique that she pioneered was universally employed in her boss's lab to discover all of these other recept receptors, the, can the cannabis receptor, the nicotine receptor. Basically, it sort of, it, it opened the floodgates to drug development. Her boss saw an opportunity. Initially, he had tried to, he told her that she wasn't going to be able to do this. He tried to sort of put the kibosh on her experiment. She snuck into the lab after hours and did it anyway. And then he took credit. He was, he received the Lasker Award, which is America's highest scientific honor, which is, and, and is often a precursor to the Nobel Prize. And he cut her out. And he has gone on to have a massive and phenomenal career. And she didn't go quietly which is what she was supposed to do as a young woman. She raised, you know, she raised hell and she went to largely female journalists and she 
was credited with disgracing her mentor and became the scarlet woman of neuroscience. And that, you know, that reputation as a rabble rouser, as a female firebrand, followed her throughout her career. And I mean, there was truth to it. She definitely had sharp elbows. She was a tough cookie. And yet at the same time, that wasn't fair. And it was, and it was terrible that she was cut out. So that was sort of one first example where that was, I mean, that, you know, behavior against women that was totally normalized at the time where she really spoke out against, you know, the way that women in science were treated. (laughs) Then we can go on to what happened at the NIH, which is kind of exciting too. Mm -hmm. That was my next one. Yes, please. So when she was, again, chief of brain biochemistry at the NIH, after having proven the mind-body link, she was doing more, you know, more and more um, experiments in the world of what's called PNI, psychoneuroimmunology. She was working, she was doing visionary interdisciplinary research, again, at a time when most people just worked in their little stovepipes. They weren't thinking about how the systems were all connected. She received a call from someone at the National Cancer Institute, a scientist named Bill Farrar, because the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Diseases that Tony Fauci was running at the time, they were sort of locked in a heated battle to figure out the cause of AIDS. This was the 80s. And suddenly all over the place, you know, men were showing up with with homosexual men primarily were showing symptoms that had never been seen before and symptoms that plagued all of their various systems including the brain. It was called neuro AIDS. And it was basically, so a lot of these men were showing symptoms of almost, it seemed like dementia, you know, and their brain was sort of rotting. And Candace saw a path forward. She saw something that she alone could do because most people at that time didn't think the systems were connected anyway, much less that AIDS could infect the brain. Again, there was this, there was this, this was the cut, the neck was the cutoff. The brain was totally separate from the body, but Candace knew better. So she sort of, she thought that if she could sort of attack this thinking, okay, if I can find a way to show that the, that this disease can pierce the blood brain barrier, then maybe, you know, I can, I can cure those symptoms at least, you know, and then that and that became, maybe I can develop a cure for AIDS. But what happened was when she put forward her treatment, Tony Fauci at the time was running a 19 member committee that decided which AIDS drugs would move forward to clinical trials. And there weren't the same biotech laws that there are now. And on that committee were people who had direct financial interests in other drugs, in competing drugs. They had commercial, they had companies, right? And they had deals with pharmaceutical companies. So those people, of course, should never have been opining on which drugs would move forward because they were in competition. It was a zero-cut-sum game. They were all, many of her colleagues at the NIH were working hand-in-glove with Big Pharma, and they stood to personally benefit you know, they're po- line their pockets if they found a cure. So when this young rabble rousing woman comes out and says, I think I've found the cure. Well, she got, she was summarily destroyed. I mean, she also sabotaged, she undermined herself in many ways. And I, and I hold her accountable for that, but you know, boy, this is a tragic story. And it is, a, and it is a story that sort of, you know, led to her undoing. Yeah. I think I would love for you to unpack, cause I didn't know this until recently uh, before I came to your your book event, that there are still scientists today that work for the NIH and the and you know NIMH and CDC and CMS and DA that have uh, incentives to create and commercialize drugs. So I feel like there. So you can explain that to the to the audience because I am feeling more and more like the fox watching the hen house is in effect here. I mean, this is this is a great tragedy and it's incredibly frightening to me. So beginning in the early 80s, um, President Reagan slashed funding for healthcare. Um, you know, slashed funding from the NIH and from institute, you know, from from academic institutions. And as a result, researchers started seeking funding from pharmaceutical companies. Well, that obviously created a conflict of interest. You know, the result, those financial ties meant that big pharma was influencing research studies to maximize their own profits. So this was fascinating to me. By 1985, university scientists were all benefiting personally from this influx of cash. 
Many of them were on Big Pharma's dole. You know, half of technology research faculty members at top universities consulted to industries, and a quarter of them were leading commercial studies. I mean, this is this is stunning, right? So, and by the mid 1990s, more than a third of clinical faculty members at the nation's top 50 university hospitals were on the dole, and they were administering chosen treatments to patients. So, Big Pharma was paying them to sort of say, "Hey, you know, instead of this drug, push this one," right? And then it gets worse. So then what happened was big like pharmaceutical companies realized that they could sort of cut out the bureaucracy of academic institutions by creating their own what's called CROs, contract research organizations. So these were for-profit endeavors that were conducting clinical trials and that owned the data from the clinical trials. So they would look at the data before they ever got, but before before the academic researchers ever got involved, the pharmaceutical companies are cutting the data, and only delivering favorable data to academic researchers who are then who don't in some cases don't even know that they're reading receiving only a subset of the full data set. They are writing positive, glowing reports with the imprimatur of their academic with their you know their ostensibly fair and free academic institution, the imprimatur of the, on there. And those are what is getting published in medical journals. So our doctors, our family doctors, who think that they are getting non-biased reports, unbiased reports that are cut from academic institutions, they're not from academic institutions at all. They're being funded by large pharmaceutical companies. So this was hidden. This whole practice was hidden from the American medical community. And going back to the fact that Candace Pert this is the, tr the great tragedy of her life, that she was like the Pandora who opened the box, who basically discovered the opiate receptor, thinking that she was going to help eradicate drug addiction. And then she was on the other side, the Cassandra, basically sounding the alarm. She was one of few scientists and researchers courageous enough to speak out. She was saying, hold on a second. Our physicians are now trigger happy when it comes to prescriptions. Why? I mean... So many of our psychiatrists and psychologists are treating the brain without any regard for its effect on the body. And then our physicians are treating the body with no effect, with no regard for its effect on the brain. No one's looking at the, at, at, at the way that all of these pharmaceuticals are sort of all of the what's called iatrogenic effects, basically all the side effects, the trickle down that, you know, you take you take an SSRI and then you gain 40 pounds, and then you have to take another drug, and then you're on Ozempic, and then you're on something else. She, I mean, truly, she was saying, hold on a second, there are natural solutions, there are things that we can do, but that doesn't line the pockets of big pharma. You know, this is, it, it's, it's actually a, a tragedy what's happened. So uh, that brings me to a very pragmatic question, because I'm pretty convinced that your story is very uncomfortable for many people in the industry that, w that you reported on. And I believe, because I'm a pragmatist, not a cynic, or maybe I am saying that you may have some interesting reaction or lack of reaction to your book simply because you're saying things that are not quite popular. Do you agree with that? I am, but I also think that integrative and functional medicine has sort of woven its way into regular society well enough now, 40 years later, that people are willing to listen. You know, the other day, interestingly, we were talking about Mar Mark Hyman. I love Mark Hyman. I was I said that to you when I, I met you. I love him. But do you know that in his Wikipedia page, it it calls, you know, he is part of a controversial group of, you know, basically says that alternative medicine is still is still controversial. Well, no, it's not, actually. Who wrote that Wikipedia page? They gotta be fired. I know, but so but what's interesting is I think the tide is turning. And I think in the 90s, when Candace was, um, she sort of became fringe in the world of science because her, you know, what she was, the ideas that she was putting forth were sort of revolutionary. And what they say is science proceeds one funeral at a time, that really ideas are slow to take root because when you've spent your whole life, you know, again, clinging white knuckled to one set of set of views, you're not going to, even in the face of conflicting evidence, people are hesitant to sort of change their views. But over a generation, over the last 40 years, so much of what Candace discovered has been shown to be true. And I think it's really infiltrating our medical system, or at least, you know, our, our daily lives. I mean, part of what she, she was saying was heretical because she was, she was knocking, you know, she was basically knocking these doctors who were once considered gods off their perch. 
and telling individuals that we could take charge of our own health. What a concept, right? What a concept. But again, that some of this remains uncomfortable to people, for sure. And um, I did send the book to, uh, you know, this is this is a later part of the story, but Candace did get involved in some rather significant crimes. And um, along with her, with her spouse at the time, and um, I did send the book to the three heads of the different institutes at the National Institutes of Health that have now that have in the last few years given him six million dollars of new grants, uh, someone they know to be a criminal. So it appears that the NIH does not have any institutional memory. And so they you know, I mean, this so they have sort of forgotten this alleged patent fraud and defrauding people that occurred. And that's where our taxpayer money is going. And so I may, you know, so they've sent me links to sort of file official complaints in a journalistic capacity. But this is my view in this. I've always seen my job as illumination, you know, sh showing the truth. And then people can do with it. My job is not justice. There are many people in Candace's family who feel like she was really shut down and that her voice was silenced um, in many ways. And they sort of want justice. And I've sort of had to say, pull back a little bit to say, I believe in justice, but my job is truth. And if justice follows truth, then, you know, glory be. But that's right. Yeah, no, your your job is truth. And I believe, I mean, this should definitely be a documentary or a, a series for sure. I, 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 There's no other way around this not being told. You have to tell the story and somebody has to help you get it to market in that way because it's huge. Um, I'm just so excited to even be talking about you know, again, it spans so many decades. I mean, what do you what do you want to tell people that are listening to this podcast or we're going to, you know, tell more people about the book and, and your story and, and your dedication to truth? What is it that you want to leave people with on this? I think when I looked at the course of Candace's life, I mean, I had I went through my own sort of very emotional journey with her because I started out loving this woman. You know, I absolutely thought that she was a role model and a star, and she was. But there was also a point in her life. I mean, you know, you look at those points in anybody's life, these inflection points where you can go one way or the other, you know, and I think she was groomed in these systems that were incredibly calculating and backbiting. And she was a product of these systems, right? She replicated that, those behaviors to succeed. Like a lot of women did at the time, by the way, because that was, there was only one mode of leadership and it was male and it was cutthroat, right? And so I think she ended up doing, uh, she was groomed to succeed in this one way and she replicated those behaviors. And then I think she really knew she had a conscience and, and she, she had a deep, love of her work and her family, she knew and she, she did it anyway. And so I think it's one of those questions of like, for, for me, my journey was how do you hold both truths? How can you say someone was an incredible star who contributed so much to society and she should be revered, but her tale is also a cautionary tale of like, what turns a good woman bad? You know? And it was like, it made me really think deeply about those moments in my own life where you know, you can go one way or the other because our actions define us, you know, and our legacy and our legacy. That's right. We have choice and agency. I talk about that in my book a lot. Micro decisions make macro outcomes. Like in that moment, when you make that decision to go left or to go right, will dictate the road that and the path that you will be on later. A hundred percent, you know, and I think that there were some of those decisions where she sort of went the wrong way. And that was deeply sad to me. And yet I will say that so many of her male colleagues at the NIH and elsewhere made similarly terrible decisions and have gone on to have spectacular careers and remain in power. And so it is, there is, you know, there's a chapter in there where I discuss, you know, this sort of feminist angle on this, you know, like what then are the consequences of a morally ambiguous woman fearlessly trying to change the world? You know, her male counterparts got away with it and she was burned at the stake. So where's the justice there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that, that there was so much uh, duality in, and in, in her career and the environment that she grew up in and the scientists she was surrounded with and the scientists that are still at the helm of these institutions, which frankly, you know, that merits a whole expose in and of itself, because I don't think that people understand who's at the helm and what they're doing and what they've done 
and we're still living with their bullshit. So I think that story needs to be um, told loud and clear. So what do you want people to do as a result of this podcast or as a result of your book or as a result of our discussion? What is it that you want to have them think about? I, I think changing the American healthcare system, honestly, like using Candace's story as a launch pad to actually really part of what I did again, she, her personal story is fascinating, but when you see it in the context of these wider systems that fuel greed and dysfunction and are actually hurting the American public, I think diving deep on the healthcare story is really, really important. Like you said, and what the the great beauty of this is that I interviewed so many of her colleagues have now retired or on the verge of retiring, and they told me the truth. They told me the truth of what happened at that time, you know, during the AIDS crisis. And so many, as you just said, of these people have remained in power, and they've been allowed to to spend years and years just doing really bad things and things that are not like you think that people who subscribe to the Hippocratic Oath first do no harm are somehow driven by, you know, a genuine desire to serve, you know, service. But what I found is that the same greed that blights other industries absolutely blights medical research. It's still a business. It is a business like that is that is more corrupt than most. And so I think taking a deep look at that and then also taking a personal responsibility for our health for our own personal health and seeking natural solutions is something that we should also that we should all consider. Because Candace's view was that when it came to prescription drugs, that our natural state is one of bliss and that when it comes to prescription and that our bodies are able to heal themselves without external intervention often. I mean, and when it comes to prescription drugs, that less is best. So good. So, so good. Yeah. I, I would regale you with the story about me telling a cardiologist to go F himself at some point in time. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> when he told me that I needed to be put on a, on a statin preventatively because my full was at 199 and he wanted to put my husband on Lipitor. And, I, and, and my husband was like, just don't make a big deal. It's just a little pill. I go, no, no, no. It is a big deal. And this is what could happen to you. And it wasn't until I told him about the side effects that he had genuine concern about, which had to do with his manhood, that he listened to what I had to say. <laughs> it's always there. It's always there. I was like, honey, do you know that that could malfunction? <laughs> oh, okay. Now I'm listening. Neither of our best interests. You know? <laughs> So that's when I got the attention, but I told the cardiologist to go F himself. Yes. Well, good. If we actually think or empowered to think for ourselves and read for ourselves, we can find there are lots of different ways to heal. It's funny that other, in, other cultures across the globe have been doing it for thousands of years, but yet I have people look at me straight in the face and say, well, herbs don't work. I'm really, tell the Chinese that, tell the Indians that, tell the Native Americans that, tell the people that didn't have pharmacology in their world before. I don't know. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> no, you don't. It's totally true. This is why I'm so I'm so committed to helping you tell your story. So what is it that we can um, tell? 2024 planning, Pamela Rickman, what does that look like? How can we support? In 2024, I would love to get this story out to as many people as possible. Honestly, I the end game for me is for this to be a limited series, a film or a limited series, you know, fictionalized about Candace's life, because that was actually my initial goal six years ago when I started this work. I mean, I just, she is such a compelling character and her narrative arc is so dramatic that I know that she's, you know, I mean, she is one of the most entertaining and wild people that I could have ever have spent six years living beside. So I am, I am absolutely committed to that end goal. And yet at the same time, I think the way to get there is just to keep telling the story, to keep talking about it to as many people as possible, to keep sharing it and to get her back in the history books where she belongs. Because this is a woman, she wasn't entirely a hidden figure. She received a, a lot of acclaim during her life, and yet she's been totally lost. The Body Keeps the Score, Bessel van der Kolk's best-selling book, is entirely based on her research, and he doesn't name-check her. Her um, studies are so baked in now to, to medical science, the mind-body connection, that, that they've been detached from her name. And she deserves her rightful place in history. As do you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. As do you. That is, that's impressive. I really, I, let's thank you 
first of all, let's put a pin in the amazing thank you and for sharing that story and for the commitment that you had to see this story through. And I'm sure there's a few people that are looking at your book and going, oh shit, the gig is up. Well, let's hope their gig is up. I really do. I will hand deliver your book to anybody you want me to hand deliver that book to and be like, yo, your story's out, babe. You've got to stop this right now because somebody's watching you. Yes. And we are watching you. And hopefully the people listening to this podcast and anyone else we will share it with are also paying attention to what's going out. Big pharma, women not getting credit where they should, untold stories, stories that are research that should be attributed to the to its rightful owner, discoveries and revolutions of three three areas of our current healthcare system not attributed attributed to this wonderful woman. And you know, Pamela is here to tell the story to all of us if we would listen. So thank you very much. Stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to Possibilities with Monique DeMeo. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to Possibilities with Monique DeMeo, where we unpack life as a female mover and shaker. If you like the show, please consider liking it or better still, subscribing to it and leaving us a rating. It truly does help. Also, you can pick up my book, The Seven Secrets to Creating a Life You Love, a practical guide for women in leadership. You can find the book, other episodes of this podcast, and how to stay in touch at MoniqueDeMeo.com. D-E-M-A-I-O. I look forward to seeing you again soon. With gratitude, Monique.